I now would like to transition to the keynote speaker. And the individual that is going to be delivering our keynote speaker today is Manish Dasar from Accenture. He's the managing director at Accenture. And as a luminary in the data space, Manish is responsible for leading digital transformation and positioning organizations to take advantage of digital disruptions in the marketplace. He is based in California and has spent over 15 years in data space working across government and private sector. Can you please help me welcome Manish? Thank you. Thank you. Karen, thank you for that round of applause for her. That was fantastic. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. It's nice to know some things don't change, right? The front of the class is still empty seats. I want to commend you guys for sitting up there. That's great. Uh, my name is Manish Tassar. I'm a managing director with Accenture Digital. My background and career has always been focused on data and analytics. And I'm thrilled to be up here with you guys today talking about the digital revolution. Before we get into it, I want to tell you guys a little story. Let me get my clicker here. I want to tell you a little story. Uh, a few years ago, when Hurricane Katrina hit the coast of the United States, <clears throat> a very large retailer wanted to do a study on what products they sold out of as folks were going into the store, preparing themselves for the storm that was coming. And uh, a room full of very intelligent, experienced executives thought through what those products might be. And they had very intelligent answers. They had answers like flashlights, batteries, uh, water, uh, canned foods, sandbags. But when we ran the data and you ran the analytics, the number one product was Budweiser. It was beer. The power of data to illuminate insight, to give us, to take us beyond intuition and help us make a data-empowered decision has a material impact on everything that we do. And if I'm going to convince you of anything this morning, it's going to be uh, one of my favorite phrases, in God we trust, everybody else bring data. Right? So that, that's, that's the whole point today. All right, so let's get into it. Let me talk about what I mean by the digital revolution, if my clicker works here. There it is. OK. So before we start talking about where we're headed and where the growth is going to come from, Let's start with where we've been. So I want to give you guys a little bit of a historical context here, right? So we're going to put a timeline up here. My clicker takes like a, a couple clicks here. All right, here we go. Ooh, don't want to jump ahead of here. All right, somewhere between 1940 and 1979, and there's a range here because we're quite honestly not sure, the first digital computer gets invented. Now, there's a little bit of an argument about what was first and who invented it, but most people think it's this one here. That's the ENIAC. Uh, computer is the first digital one stored currently at the University of, uh, of Pennsylvania. And we're off and running, right? Uh, it's officially switched us into the world of digital computing. And from there, our revolution really kicks off. Then we'll head into the 1980s. Um, is there a few 80s babies in here? Come on, I'm an 80s baby. There's got to be a few 80s babies in here. So in addition to weird fashion and weird hair, we, we do get a lot of cool stuff coming out of the 80s, and most importantly, data becomes more compact. We can now put it on CDs. We can put it on hard disks. The PC becomes the home machine that we all know and love today, right? It becomes pervasive in everybody's business environment and personal environment. Time Magazine calls it computer of the year, or sorry, man of the year, uh, because we see it starting to be used for entertainment systems. That is a picture of Nintendo, one of my favorite systems when I was a kid. And we start seeing the combination of data and advanced algorithms to be made into the computer itself, right? So this is the first decade we have computers now beating chess masters, right? And that's an example of a CPU there that was able to beat uh, one of the big chess masters in the 80s. So we're rapidly evolving here. Now we get to the 90s. <clears throat> Are there a few 90s babies in here? 
There's got to be a few. Are you kidding me? All right, I saw a couple of hands. All right, in the 90s, uh, we get two really, really big things. Uh, we get the rise of enterprise OS systems like Windows that are able to standardize the way we all engage with computers, the way we engage with data, they give us a uniform language on how to interact with these devices. And as a result, they put us all on the same learning curve, on the adoption curve. We're now able to talk to each other and interact with each other through a common interface. And we get the World Wide Web. Uh, obviously developed for military use first, but we quickly realize that it's going to have a lot of good benefits in exchanging data, and it starts to really kick us off and explode into the digital economy that we're going to talk about in a few minutes here. All right. The years 2000s, that decade. This is now, we're getting really complex now in our use of data. We get the rise of the search engines like Google and Yahoo that are able to take a huge amounts of data and apply algorithms so we can all do search and analysis on it. We start getting the rise of cloud computing in this decade. We start getting mobile devices. If you remember, your first iPhone was in this decade. Uh, we get the App Store. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, right? Because the App Store is, is one of the key ways we launch into this digital economy where now we're doing commerce online uh, as a, in a way that we've never done before this decade. We get geospatial data uh, and ability to pinpoint locations, use maps, get directions. And we get the rise of business intelligence, the rise of reporting uh, and analysis of historical trends, anomalies, and patterns using data. Now we're in the 2010s, the decade we're in now, and now we're getting new things, and Karen touched on, on a few of these already. We get the Internet of Things, we get connected devices where devices are talking to each other. We get voice recognition and artificial intelligence through tools like Siri. We get mobile devices and wearable devices. I'm sure a lot of you have got one of these on today. We get the data explosion that Karen alluded to continues to progress, so therefore, Technologies evolve for us to harness, store, and take care of big data. And we get the right advanced analytics, right? We shift from looking at um, what had happened to now looking at what may happen and taking a look at contextual and predictive analytics that allow us to do that. So we've been on this journey for a while, right? So this, is, this has been our revolution. And in the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about where, where I think we're headed what trends I think are going to separate leaders in this revolution versus stragglers in this revolution, and what things I'd like for you to keep in mind uh, as you explore the rest of your day here. And given that we're in California, we're going to have a little bit of fun with it. I've got a little movie theme. Like Russ said, I am an absolutely a data nerd and data geek, but I'm going to make it uh, as fun as I can for you. So I'm going to put up a screenshot of a movie, and if you know what it is, go ahead and yell it out. OK? Who's got it? I give you a hard one to start off with. Ooh, Minority Report and Accountant, close, not quite. This is a screenshot from The Social Network, uh, the movie about Facebook, if you remember that. So uh, in, in a lot of ways, this trend is called data explosion. In a lot of ways, social networks like Facebook have contributed quite a bit to our data explosion. So let me define what I mean by data explosion. Right? Karen touched on this a little bit. 90% of all the data we have today was generated in the last two years. Let me just say that one more time. All of the data we have available as a species right, was generated in the last two years. And it is not going to slow down. Uh, we expect that the data is going to grow at about 50x per year over the next five years. So this is not going to slow down, right? She mentioned Yoda bytes. We're definitely going to get there. We're already at exabytes. That's a lot of zeros, right? And that is how we measure data scale now. And it is absolutely getting faster. So the explosion's real. So now let's talk about what's going to happen as we know this data is going to continue to grow. 32% of agencies agree that citizens are better informed about data and technologies than their organizations. And I'm seeing some nods in the room, so I know you guys are feeling this as well, right? But organizations are certainly reacting, right? Over the next five years, we think there's going to be 2 million new jobs for data-savvy analysts and managers. So if you're in this room and you're in the data space, you are absolutely in the right industry at the right time. We're just scratching the surface here, and this is going to continue to grow. Karen talked about the CDO, the Chief Digital Officer position. That's been a huge area of growth at the executive level. 
In 2010, we had about 15. <laughs> in 2016, we've now at 1,400. Right, so that growth and that demand for data professionals, all the way from the analyst level, all the way to the CDO level, is something that is becoming pervasive in, in both public and private sector. And it excites someone like me, and it should excite you as well, because I absolutely think we're all in the right space and absolutely the right time for having these kinds of discussions. But there's still a long way to go, right? Our, our citizens are now expecting an enhanced experience, right? Um, I like to coin something called the, the digital native, and, and I'll give you a perspective on what I mean by that. Um, millennials, or whatever you want to call them, that are born recently are digital natives. They were born into a world with digital capabilities. They expect that as a native part of their experience. It's nothing new for them, right? Um, when I was a kid, I used to wake up at around 8 o'clock every Saturday morning and watch Saturday morning cartoons. Now I have a son who's four. And I talked to him the other day about the concept of waking up at 8 a.m. on Saturday to watch cartoons. And his response was, why? I'll just turn the cartoon on when I want. Because he's used to an on-demand experience. He's used to opening up the iPad and launching Spider-Man when he wants to watch it, not when Spider-Man's on at 8 o'clock on Saturday morning. That's a digital native. And we have a long way to go. To this day, only 0.5% of all available data is ever analyzed. Right, so just think about the potential there. On one hand, you've got growth at the rate of 50x. And on the other hand, we're only analyzing 0.5%. So there's a huge amount of potential here. Um, and with data continuing to be a differentiator in both private and public sectors, I think you're going to see a ton of investment, a ton of growth, and a ton of emphasis put on, on being able to analyze and gain insight from data. OK, you guys ready for the, for the next movie? All right, it gets a little easier. The first one was hard. I, I'm with you. Who knows this one? Goodwill Hunting. Yeah, that's right. It's my favorite movie of all the screenshots I have here. That's Matt Damon writing some, some mathematical equation that I, I don't understand. But this one is called the Data Empowered Enterprise. Right? And what I wanted to do here was highlight for you what I think are the key trends and characteristics of organizations that get this right of organizations that do this well. So before we talk about what those trends are, let's talk about why that's important, right? For a typical Fortune 1000 company, if you increase the data that they analyze and take action on by 10%, that typically results in $60 million of net income. That's a material impact to your bottom line. 10% more in access and analysis and taking action on data results in 60 million more in revenue. So you can tell why people care, because it is absolutely critical in proving to be a differentiator. And it's not just that. Companies that invest in data outperform their competitors, outperform S&P 500 by 64%. And even in times of trouble, companies that invest in data recover faster from economic downturn. Data helps you power through when you're growing and helps you protect when you're in trouble. And therefore, you're going to see a huge amount of investment from all organizations to become a data-empowered enterprise because it's going to make a material impact to everybody's figures. So let's talk about what that means right, and what characteristics are important. The first one I have here is called the democratization of intelligence. Now, we're, we're all in public and government here, so the word democracy should mean something for us. I chose that word carefully. Um, but this is about, democratization of intelligence is about pushing the power of data and the power of analytics out to everyone in the enterprise. Now, with the way we used to do it is there was a group of power users, I think Russ called us data geeks, uh, whatever you want to call it, but a group of people that were really good at data, they crunched all the numbers, they calculated all the reports, they put it into a 550-page Excel sheet with a bunch of pivot tables, and this, then they emailed it out to everyone. That is not the way we do it now. Data-empowered enterprises put the power of data and insight directly into the hands of consumers. They have systems that are intuitive enough for consumers to use without being a data geek. And those consumers are making decisions, having conversations based on data and not on intuition. Right? So our retailers are stocking Budweiser instead of water bottles because they know that's what people are coming in to buy. 
right? So democratization of data, I think, is going to be a key trend for a data-empowered enterprise. Let's talk about the next one here. This one's called being design-led, right? And we're going to have a breakout session about this a little bit later, and, and if you're interested in this, you should certainly join. But being design-led is all about keeping the end user experience in mind, right? Because the point here is not to have only the data scientists and the data analysts be able to understand the data environment and gain insight from it. The point is to have everyone gain insight from it, folks that aren't technologists, folks that don't know how to write SQL statements. And the way we do that is be design-led, keep the end user experience in mind and make it simple, make it intuitive to use, and as a result, we can help our first trend here around democratization of it. So we're going to talk a little bit about what design-led means in the breakout session. If you're interested more in that, we should, you should certainly join us. This one here is called shifting to advanced analytics, right? Going from what happened to what will happen. And it's not that one is more important than the other. They're both important, and they complement each other, right? You need to be able to look at a historical trend and see what has happened. But you also want analytical models that help you predict what will happen. And I'll give you an example here. Has anyone seen a House of Cards on Netflix? All right, it's one of my favorite shows, but it's also one of my favorite analytic stories. So when Netflix was deciding whether they want to produce House of Cards or not, uh, they decided to take a very analytics-based approach to this. Now, I don't know if you guys know, but entertainment is a very unpredictable business, right? One year you could have one star, one director, one genre, and have it be a major hit. And the next year, you could have the same star, same director, similar genre, and have it not be a hit. So it's a very unpredictable kind of environment. So they wanted to use analytics to drive some predictability and ensure that House of Cards was going to be a success before they invested time and money and everything else into it. So they looked at the user data that they have, and they realized three factors. One, the director they used of House of Cards has a very high rating, and most users really like his work. Second, the British version of House of Cards was successful, right? Uh, and they had some metrics on that. And third, almost everything that Kevin Spacey does is, uh, is really pretty well liked. And based on factors like that, they decided to fund and produce House of Cards, and, and now we know it as a major success. So that's an example of driving predictability into future models using analytics. Right? And we're, we're going to talk a little bit how we see that in government as well, because it is pervasive across industry now. And the last one I have is new data sources, new technologies, new delivery models. And we're going to talk about each one of these three things in a little bit of detail as we continue. But the short of it is the ability to combine internal data sources and external data sources, whether they're social media sources or any other unstructured data sources, is giving folks the advantage of having a comprehensive 360 view to data. And with the rise of new technologies like cloud, like big data, like visual analytics, these are enabling us to take advantage of that new data source, of that consolidated data set, and disseminate that information across the enterprise. And the last one, the new delivery model, we're going to certainly talk about this one. This is all about getting that insight out to the market, out to the users, measuring that time in weeks, not quarters, not years. Right? Getting it out to the market faster and more hitting the mark from a user experience perspective based on this new delivery models. So there's a lot there. We're going to talk about it all. And there's a cost to not doing this. Right? I'll give you another Netflix story. Netflix reports that they have 60 seconds to give the user relevant and engaging information before they stop paying attention. That's an important metric, and they measure themselves against that. They measure their analytical algorithms against that. They measure their visualization on the app against that, right? They have 60 seconds to keep you interested, to show you what you might want to see next before you start losing interest. And it's paying attention to metrics like this is the reason why we don't use Blockbuster anymore, right? There's a cost to not doing this stuff right. And uh, this is an example of organizations that pay attention to these kinds of metrics.